Hello, my name is Joy McIntyre, and welcome to the third chapter of our series, Who's Afraid of Hugo Wolf? The year is 1885. Mark Twain just published Huckleberry Finn. Edvard Grieg had written The Holberg Suite. Dvorak had composed his seventh symphony and was on the verge of a world career. Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado was first performed in London. And in Vienna, Brahms had completed his final symphony and the 25-year-old Hugo Wolf was making a name for himself as a music critic for the Wiener Salonblatt. That was not exactly the life of a celebrated composer that Wolf had envisioned for himself, but he was probably glad for the income. His friends and family had been propping him up financially for years. As a man with little money, you might think he would be careful not to say anything that would risk his reputation. Measured responses, however, were not characteristic of Wolf's rather volatile temperament. As one biographer put it, the whole mass of his critical writings was permeated through and through with sneers and jeers. Early on, Wolf had admired Brahms' music and even sought Brahms' opinion of some of his compositions. Instead of the praise which Wolf expected, the elder man suggested that he should refine his skills by studying counterpoint. <clears throat> that didn't set too well with Hugo and may indeed have been the source of Wolf's later animosity towards Brahms. Wolf had long idolized Richard Wagner and was relentless in his promotion of Wagner's music, pretty much denouncing everyone else. Brahms was a favorite target. But Brahms, 27 years older and considerably wiser, appears to have shrugged off the inflammatory comments of the younger man. Nevertheless, in 1885, against all odds, Hugo Wolf stood on the threshold of a period of great productivity and long sought public recognition. More about Hugo Wolf a little later. Johannes Brahms was born in Hamburg in 1833, but like Mozart and Beethoven before him, was drawn to Vienna. Vienna was a kind of crucible for musicians. If you were involved in music, Vienna was where the action was. Brahms was not impressed by the Wagner cult of his day. Instead, he tended to look to the examples and forms developed by his great predecessors for inspiration. Brahms wrote about 200 songs. Many of them, such as Da Unten im Tale, were, are directly based on folk songs. Others, born out of that tradition, such as Vergebliche Ständchen, a classic dialogue song, became charming art songs. We will start today's musical examples with two famous songs by Brahms, both from Opus 105. Like his great friend Robert Schumann, Brahms was a master of melodies. And this one proclaims the virtue of melody in the title. Wie Melodien sieht es mir leise durch den Sinn. And this melody is a genuine Ohrwurm. Ohrwurm is rather unglamorously translated as earworm. In three gentle strophes with minor variations, it wriggles its way into our musical memory. The poet, Klaus Groth, says, like melodies, it runs quietly through my mind. Like spring flowers, 
It blooms and drifts away like perfume. Then the word grasps it and brings it to awareness, whereupon it fades and disappears like a wisp of air. Nevertheless, there lies hidden in rhyme a fragrance that brings a tear to the eye. Robin? Like Schubert, who lived in the shadow of the still-living Beethoven, the awesome memory of Beethoven's nine great symphonies made Brahms slow to turn his attention to that genre. Nevertheless, he produced four great symphonies of his own. Brahms was a man of considerable self-discipline, which may account for his preference for formal musical structures. It is said that he was deeply in love with Clara Schumann, who shared his disdain for Wagner and Liszt. But despite her early widowhood, they simply remained devoted friends for 40 years and died within one year of each other. Our next song, Immer leiser wird mein Schlummer, is another Ohrwurm. Brahms was himself so fond of this melody that it appears in the third movement of his second piano concerto played by the solo cello. Brahms was a celebrated pianist and the piano accompaniments to his songs are often technically quite challenging, but the lush melodies are kept to a manageable range. In this particular song, you will find some interesting key changes piling up every second measure or so. And although he would never admit it, perhaps Hugo Wolf took note of that, since his songs make ample use of constantly changing tonalities. In this song, the poet, Hermann von Ling, who was a military doctor, describes dying by saying, my sleep becomes more and more quiet. My sorrow lies over me like a veil. In my dreams, I hear you outside my door, but no one opens. I wake and weep bitterly. Yes, I must die 
and when I am pale and cold, you will kiss another. If you want to see me one more time, come soon. Even in this moment of despair, Brahms retains the strophic form with only slight variations. There is a stirring moment when he underlines the agitation of the singer, introducing a kind of breathless syncopation in the piano, which continues to the end of the song. So now let's listen to Sarah. Wolf was born in 1860. An interesting period in music history, Wagner had just completed Tristan und Isolde, Gunnar's Faust had just been premiered, and Debussy would be born just two years later. In his early years, Wolf was praised by his teachers. He did well in school and was well liked by his friends. 
After age 10, however, things began to change. He was impatient with his teachers and the structured education in general, certainly not a properly or obedient schoolboy. His father despaired. Frequent changes of schools were the result, meeting with the same dismal failures. And adding to his unhappiness, his mother died in 1872. As Hugo became more and more passionate about music, he also became more restless and began a campaign to persuade his father to allow him to attend the conservatory in Vienna. Finally, after some time, Hugo's dearest wish was fulfilled and an aunt helped him move to Vienna and enter the conservatory. Reputedly, Wolf had great personal charm, which stood him in good stead during his increasingly nomadic life in Vienna. He changed lodgings frequently, even sharing rooms briefly with Gustav Mahler. In the conservatory, his pattern of dissatisfaction continued. Although he studied with some of the same professors as his friend Mahler, Wolf declared them wholly inadequate and resolved to teach himself. After only a few years, he left the conservatory in a huff, or perhaps he was dismissed. No surprise there. Gustav Mahler, of course, was born the same year as Wolf, but he had a longer view in mind and persevered. Graduating from the conservatory with numerous honors, his career path clearly laid out before him. After leaving the conservatory, Wolf stayed in Vienna. Like Schubert before him, he survived on the largesse of his friends by teaching and playing musical gigs. Then, as mentioned initially, he landed a job as a music critic for the Wiener Salonblatt. In Vienna at that time, it was not easy to find a critic who could give an impartial analysis of a musical work or performance. They tended to divide into camps, promoting or opposing various composers, pro-Wagner, anti-Wagner, pro-Bruckner, anti-Bruckner, and so on. And Wolf certainly continued that tradition. Hugo Wolf wrote 242 songs for voice and piano. The poems of Eichendorf, Goethe, and Marika, in particular, spurred him to a great outpouring of song. He wrote 50 Goethe lieder in three and a half months. By my count, in the year 1888 alone, he composed over 90 songs, sometimes two or three per day, and the vast majority were memorable. Sadly, however, these spurts of productivity alternated with periods of depression when the muse deserted him completely. While Schubert elevated minor poems by the quality of his music, for Wolf, the quality of the poem was essential for musical inspiration. He created innovative harmonic schemes. On those occasions when he repeated musical material, there were intentional dramatic effects. Examples can be found in the songs Beni Deit, Die Seelge Mutter, and the great classic Verborgenheit, which Sarah will sing for us in a moment. These two songs have a modified ABCA form. The repetition of the peaceful initial A section signifies a welcome return to serenity after an anguished harmonic maze in the B and C sections in the middle of the song. The structure of Verborgenheit reminds me a little of some of Handel's Da Capo Arias, where a frantic middle section is followed by the quiet return to the beauty of the first section. The title, Verborgenheit, means literally concealment, but it is layered with a feeling 
of being protected. The words say, leave me alone, O world. Do not tempt me with the gifts of love. Leave this heart alone with its rapture and pain. I don't know what I'm mourning. It is an unknown pain, but through tears I can see the dear light of the sun. I am seldom aware of the bright joy that bursts through the burden in my heart. And then a short piano transition brings us back to Lass, O Welt, O Lass me sein, let me be. Sarah? Now let's take a quick look at the title of this series, Who's Afraid of Hugo Wolf? Well, afraid is perhaps not the right word. I don't think anybody's literally afraid. But I have to say that Wolf is not always the first choice when singers are planning a song recital. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> I love Hugo Wolf. <laughs> but why is that? A few reasons. Wolf's songs are sometimes not easy musically. Rather than a tuneful melody, the interaction of text and music is the primary objective of the songs. The musical drama is generated by the text and illustrated by the accompaniment. The scale of the music and drama is contained like a fine mosaic compared with the broader strokes, let's say, of Richard Strauss. Unlike Brahms and Mahler, there are no obvious uh, influences of the folk song 
genre. Some knowledge of the German language does help appreciate the synthesis of text and music. So let's put that to the test with the next song, In dem Schatten meiner Locken, one of his most popular songs, In the Shadow of My Locks. This song is part of a collection of Spanish songs which were translated by the German poets Paul Heise and Emanuel Geibel. Wolf seemed attracted to the exotic climes of Spain and Italy as other authors and musicians of the 19th century had been before him. This Spanish Liederbuch is divided into secular and religious texts. In dem Schatten meiner Locken belongs clearly to the secular side. The text says, in the shadow of my locks, my beloved fell asleep. Should I awaken him? Oh no. Every morning I carefully comb my locks, but the wind messes them up. All of that makes my beloved sleepy. Should I awaken him? Oh no. I have to listen how his heart longs for my kisses. He calls me his snake yet he falls asleep by my side. Should I awaken him? Oh no. Now let us turn to Gustav Mahler. Mahler was born in Moravia, now a part of the Czech Republic. At that time, it was a part of the Habsburg Empire and therefore he is considered an Austrian composer. His path was quite different from his school friend Hugo Wolf. He completed his course of study at the Vienna Conservatory. Since he had failed to win the coveted Beethoven Prize with his submission, Das Klagende Lied, he decided to become a conductor and then made his way through various posts as conductor in the German provinces, ending up in Hamburg. Hugo Wolf's nemesis, Johannes Brahms, then helped Mahler 
obtain the post of director of the Viennese court opera, where he remained for the next 10 years. Fortunately for future generations of music lovers, his career as a composer was just postponed. His orchestral works are well known to today's audiences, but few are familiar with his wonderful art songs. He composed four memorable song cycles, not counting Das Lied von der Erde, Lieder eines fahrenden Gesellen, Das Knaben Wunderhorn, Kindertotenlieder und Rückertlieder. Robin is going to sing one of the songs from Mahler's Knaben Wunderhorn, The Boy's Magic Horn. This cycle, based on folk song texts, was first published by Achim von Arnim and Clemens Brentano, both fabled names in German literary history. It tells the story of a magic horn that plays wondrous music with just one touch of a finger. Mahler, who had a fondness for folk songs, composed it during his years as a conductor in Hamburg achieving a perfect synthesis of art and folk music. Wer hat dies Liedlein erdacht? Who thought up this little song, is the translation. The text says, up there on the mountain, in the high house, a girl is peeping out of the window, but she doesn't belong to the house. She is the tavern keeper's daughter. Then he addresses her directly. Your dark eyes and red mouth have made my heart sick. Please, darling, come heal me. Who thought up this little ditty? Three geese brought it over the water. And if you can sing it, you can whistle it. Robin? As we have said, Gustav Mahler was born the same year as Hugo Wolf. But although he had long suffered a heart defect, he outlived Wolf by eight years. The last years of his life included long periods of time in New York at the Metropolitan Opera and with the New York Philharmonic. Mahler died feted on both sides of the Atlantic, a lauded composer, an esteemed conductor, and a legendary opera administrator. Hugo Wolf's productive periods were, however, intermittent throughout his life. And finally, 
shrouded in the clouds of mental illness, Wolf died, Harold did only by his friends and supporters. Let's allow Hugo Wolf to have the last word. Verschwiegene Liebe, silent love. This lovely song was inspired by a poem von Josef von Eichendorf. The prevailing mood of the poem is the transitory nature of life. The author creates a kind of poetic circle. Over the treetops, fields, and moonlight, who could grasp them? Thoughts are flowing. The night is silent, and thoughts are free. She might guess who is thinking of her in the rustling grove when no one is awake. Like clouds floating by, my love is silent and beautiful as the night. Please listen to the special treatment that Wolf gives to the word verschwiegen, meaning silent. John? Just four years after Wolf's death, the English critic and biographer Ernest Newman declared that Hugo Wolf was the greatest of all art song composers, eclipsing even his predecessors. Personally, I don't think it has to be a contest. Each of these art song composers has something special, precious, and unique to offer. And knowing these songs vastly enriches our experience of poetry and music. In April, we will be discussing French art songs called Melodies, charming songs by Gabriel Faure, Claude Debussy, Francis Poulenc, and Kurt Weill. 